Hello, I'm Debbie Kossman, a senior vice president in the healthcare practice at National Analysts Worldwide in Philadelphia and chair of the board of directors of the Pharmaceutical Marketing Research Group, the PMRG. Anniversaries are wonderful celebrations of history, experience, and accomplishment, but they're also a time to reflect and look forward. A hundred years ago, when National Analysts Worldwide was founded, more people died of infectious disease than of any other cause. There was no penicillin, there were almost no vaccines. Fifty years ago, when PMRG was founded, hypertension went largely untreated. The discovery of DNA was only eight years old, and sequencing of the first human genome was over 40 years in the future. It's humbling to imagine what a poor job of forecasting the healthcare future any of us might have done back then if we'd been pressed to project the state of medical affairs in 2011. But looking ahead is an essential part of what we do in our business, however challenging it may be. And as we look ahead to the next decade, there are three predictions we can make with conviction. The trends we see have less to do with which new therapies will emerge than about how care will be delivered and by whom, and about who will be, will be responsible for calculating value. First, it's a virtual certainty that clinical practice guidelines will be adopted and refined to achieve the goal of standardizing patient care across practices and geographies. Second, we can easily see that the shortage of primary care physicians will require that nurse practitioners be given greater clinical responsibility and autonomy. Third, consumer empowerment will set the stage for consumer responsibility. Patients will have to spend more of their discretionary income on health services, which will impose on them the obligation to decide what matters and how much it's worth. Each of these three changes will accelerate in the next 20 years, and each has implications, not just for how providers do their jobs, but equally for how marketing researchers do theirs. Here's why. Let's start with increasing reliance on clinical guidelines. The lack of standardization of care in the U.S. has led to shocking variations in treatment outcomes and equally shocking cost differentials, to the point that in some places and for some conditions, more money is spent to deliver worse outcomes. Not only reluctantly do we give up our autonomy in this country, but oncologists, for whom the stakes and challenges are especially high. We're early practitioners of evidence-based medicine and have already embraced clinical guidelines. They're the vanguard of the future. The move to optimize and standardize other areas of patient care gained momentum this past December when the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice announced a collaborative initiative among seven premier U.S. organizations to share data on outcomes, quality, and costs. The participants are Dartmouth-Hitchcock, Cleveland Clinic, Denver Health, Geisinger Health System, Intermountain Health, and the Mayo Clinic, organizations which together manage 10 million patients. They'll be focusing first on a handful of conditions associated with rapidly increasing costs and wide variations in quality and outcomes across the country. Among them are asthma, diabetes, heart failure, and depression. The collaborative aims to develop best practice models that will, in their words, impact the clinical care of patients across the country by disseminating these models quickly and working with providers and health systems to adapt them to local conditions. What does this trend mean for our industry? The battle for product success will increasingly be fought before a shrinking audience of decision makers who control outcome studies and write the clinical treatment guidelines, guidelines that will be followed by frontline providers and used by payers to set reimbursement policies. This means that the masses of community practitioners who implement those guidelines will become increasingly irrelevant as marketing research respondents. The treatment plans and product choices they implement 
will more faithfully follow clinical pathways they've had little role in creating. There will, of course, always be some room for interpretation by site-of-care decision-makers because clinical situations can be ambiguous and patient portraits not always crisp. But leverage with end users will diminish as the role of brands is established earlier and elsewhere. What about our second prediction? that the shortage of primary care physicians will require that new nurse practitioners assume greater clinical responsibility and autonomy. How will that affect the clinical and commercial landscape? There's rarely a clearer perch from which to make predictions about the future than demographics. And the demographics are undeniable. Both the number of people age 65 and older and the percentage of the U.S. population they represent will increase substantially between now and 2030. Chronic illness affects over 80% of older adults and consumers consumes the greatest resources. Almost a quarter of older patients have five or more chronic conditions, regularly visit 13 different physicians, and fill over 50 prescriptions annually. The demand for primary care, coordination of care, and elderly care is growing rapidly. We also know that there's already a shortage of primary care physicians. The average PCP today carries an annual caseload of approximately 2,400 patients, requiring physicians to see patient after patient throughout the day at a breakneck pace. That makes throughput the natural solution to two problems, rising volume and declining reimbursement. But both trends, the physician shortage and the attempts to curtail the cost of care, mean that even though there are many more diagnostic codes and therapies than ever before, the average patient spends far less time with his or her physician than at any time in the past. Far less time in which the provider must do far more. To meet the demand for primary care in 2030, each PCP would have to see 33% more patients than today. To avoid that, we'll need 40,000 more physicians than we expect to have. Otherwise, 95 million patients will go without access to a physician simply because of the lack of providers to handle them. And the problem can get only worse once we bring another 32 million uninsured patients into an already stressed system. Over the past 20 years, the number of nurse practitioners per capita in the United States has risen seven times faster than the number of MDs. In 2011, 16 states in the District of Columbia allow nurse practitioners to practice and prescribe independently of physicians, and 28 more states are now considering regulations that would allow NPs to practice a full range of responsibilities. Within the VA, Kaiser Permanente, and Geisinger Health Systems, the expanded role of NPs has been linked to improved quality and patient satisfaction, as well as to cost reductions. In underserved urban and rural areas, and importantly, in the rapidly expanding setting of retail clinics, nurse practitioners play an especially prominent role in the provision of primary care. Training programs across the country are moving toward curricula that will prepare NPs in gerontology as well as adult health to ensure that graduates are ready to contribute to the care of older patients. It's difficult to see how the role of nurse practitioners would not expand given all of the pressures on a system that seems overpriced, overburdened, and under-resourced. This is already true in selected states for specific treatment settings such as retail clinics, school-based health centers, community mental health clinics, and nursing homes. Going forward, NPs will increasingly be involved in specialized therapeutic areas as well, such as neonatal medicine, anesthesiology, intensive care, diabetes, and oncology. The implications for marketers and marketing researchers is very important. It means that even as we anticipate long-term shifts in marketing focus from frontline practitioners to guideline oligarchs, we will need in the near term to include NPs as marketing targets and research respondents. That brings us to our third prediction, 
the shift in responsibility to patients who will be asked to pay more out of pocket and will therefore need to play a greater role in assessing price value. In the past, the industry has paid nodding attention to patient willingness to pay, but going forward, that issue will need to become a central concern. Imagine a scenario in which a new therapy for relapsed or refractory metastatic cancer delivers a two-week increase in median survival, with respondents living about six weeks longer. If patients are unwilling to pay their share of therapy, there will be little point in investing in its development. A benchmark survey on that issue conducted by national analysts worldwide just a few years ago confirms that oncologists, who are already on the, ahead of the curve in so many ways, are increasingly implicating patients directly in this cost-benefit calculation. The UK's National Institute for Health and Clinical Effectiveness, NICE, aspires to unflinching application of cost-effectiveness hurdles for new therapies. And it's a harbinger of things to come in this country. As stewards for a larger health system, government authorities and insurers are clearly less motivated than the patients they cover to green light expensive and heroic therapies. Yet the evidence suggests that patients themselves may make trade-offs that surprise us once they have less money in their pockets and more of it's needed to pay for retirement and health care. We already know that at the pharmacy counter, a $10 copay difference easily tips the balance from a Tier 3 to a Tier 2 medication. We also know that out-of-pocket costs for more expensive therapies can discourage some patients from taking them at all. As marketing researchers, we'll have to sharpen our tools to allow us to evaluate consumers' willingness to pay, for health insurance to cover specific contingencies, and for therapies whose benefits are difficult to assess in personal terms and whose costs compete with the other things that families value just as much. The market research industries had far more experience developing intent to purchase modeling algorithms for appliances and snack foods than it has in modeling patients' intent to purchase costly life-saving therapies. We'll need to put those tools to the test to determine how well they approximate real-world behavior when the stakes are far higher and the trade-offs more emotionally complex. A century ago, in 1911, the term health insurance was coined when the British passed their National Insurance Act, the same year our own firm came into existence. In 1961, the year PMRG was founded, an NIH scientist, Marshall Nuremberg, proved that the triplet code is the way information is encoded in DNA to make proteins. Fifty years later, we've only begun to tap the therapeutic possibilities of that discovery, and yet the same 50 years has taken us with unsettling speed from boundless economic potential to daunting success hurdles and somber austerity. Marketing researchers are the people in the industry who need to see around all the sharp corners. And like the healthcare system itself, the system we serve is running out of resources. That means we'll need to be vigilant, thoughtful, and creative in order to ensure that our research remains relevant and trustworthy, even 10 years from now. <laughs>